All right. Um, it's wonderful to be back in Bismarck. I uh, always love being invited to come. <laughs> um, I think this is my fourth time here. I'm really, I'm really, uh, this is great. So um, I have been asked to specifically talk about the bionutrient meter and what we're doing with nutrient density and all that, but I also love talking about um, farming and techniques and practices, and that's really where I started my career. So I'm going to try to do a quick sort of overview of some of the basic principles that I like to talk about when I'm um, talking to growers about growing, and then we'll talk about the food quality thing and, and where all that's at, because that was what I was, I think, supposed to be talking about. But you guys are gardeners and farmers, I think, so maybe you actually care more about growing. Or anyway, I'll just start there. All right, so um, I have, um, my background, I grew up on an organic farm, as I think, I'm not sure if that was said, but I grew up on an organic farm, and um, my parents, like a lot of Farmers had a hard time making a living farming and so had a day job. Anybody who's been part of an agricultural ecosystem may know about that. Um, <laughs> somebody's got to work to pay the bills so the farmer can farm. Um, anyway, uh, that, was, that was my growing up experience. I spent my 20s uh, through college in my 20s managing my parents' farm. When I got married, I had developed no other skill sets besides farming to pay the bills. Um, and I was able to pay my bills, which weren't very much, but providing for a family I certainly couldn't do. And so rapidly s tried to figure out how to make a living farming. Um, and one of the basic insights that I struggled with was that um, part of the reason we couldn't make a living was because we had pest pressure and disease pressure. I'm not sure if you guys have insects and diseases out here. You guys have insects and diseases? You don't have any of those, no? You guys are, I know you're superior in many ways <laughs> up here in North Dakota. <laughs> um, uh, I thought, you know, if you look out in nature, you don't see many pests and diseases eating the trees and the, and the um, pastures and things like that. But you look at the farm fields and you see a lot of pest pressure and disease pressure. Um, and I thought growing up as an organic farmer, we were kind of, our noses were slightly elevated, you know, in the farmer's market um, and most other places as well because we were better people. Um, <laughs> but I thought maybe if organic was better, um, our plants should be able to make it <laughs> to the end of the growing season without being eaten alive. Um, so anyway, long story short, I uh, started reading books and going to conferences and attending seminars and things like that. And um, it sure looks like, you know, plants have evolved, I think as I said in the, in the, in the video, uh, for hundreds of millions of years to take care of themselves without a lot of human input, right? right. Plants have been around for quite some time. Fertilizer has not been around for that long. Um, so for me, the real question is, how does nature do it? What are the principles and practices by which nature is able to successfully produce crops? Um, and if, you know, and you can even look at human cultures around the planet and say, you know, um, we have examples here in North America and Australia and South America, all over the place of humans living in symbiosis with nature, functionally producing lots of food, not having a plow, a wheel, um, beasts of burden, fertilizers, insecticides, right? Indigenous cultures globally for quite some time have been successful producing a lot of food, not in this tillage, monoculture, grain-based system, but in a much more sophisticated system. So the question for me is really, you know, how does nature do it? How have, you know, traditional indigenous cultures done it? How have they worked in, har in harmony with nature? Because I grew up on a farm and we had to work all the time, and I don't particularly like working all the time. Um, I've weeded my share of weeding. I've done my share of mulching and you know all kinds of stuff. Like, there's got to be an easier way, a better way. And so, long story short, it seems to be that it's not really about the plant. It's not really about the carrot or the cucumber or the tomato or the apple or the echinacea. It's really about the microbes at the bottom of the food chain. Um, people have heard about the fact that the vast majority of the cells in your body are not human. Anybody heard this story? 90 plus percent of the cells in your body are not human, right? They're bacteria and fungi, things like that, RKE, right? There's trillions of fungi and bacteria in your body, actually. Way more of the cells in your body are not human than human. Everybody knows this? Sort of know this, right? right? Um, you also know that you cannot digest your food. Right, it's only the people inside of you that digest your food for you. Without them, you'd be dead. You know that? 
What's that, all of our elves? <laughs> we have this, this conversation about identity, and I'm a this or I'm a that. You know, I say, for starters, the first mistake is identifying as a human. Um, if 90% of the cells in your body are not human, then identifying as a human probably is a mistake, right? I would say we are actually ecosystems. We are ideally symbiotically functioning ecosystems, and sometimes we have pathogenically functioning ecosystems, so we've got diseases. But we're really a, 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 an ecosystem, ideally a symbiotic ecosystem where all the different kingdoms are functioning well together. And it seems to be basically exactly like that with plants. Um, plants cannot digest their food. They have a gut flora, the microbes in the soil and on the leaf surface, and actually inside their leaves, that digest their food for them. And so it's really about, at least as far as I understand it, creating an environment where the microbes are functioning well. When, you, when the microbes are functioning well in the environment, then the plant functions well. Only when the bottom of the food chain is healthy can the middle of the food chain be healthy. And only when the middle of the food chain is healthy can the top of the food chain be healthy. Think of the microbes as the bottom of the food chain, the plants as the middle, and the animals as the top. Um, so it's about creating a dynamic where the bottom of the food chain functions well. And what does the bottom of the food chain need to function well? Well, they need some pretty complex things like air to breathe, right? If you had a chicken, and you just put a plastic bag over its head for a couple hours, you'd have a dead chicken. A cat, cow, kid, right? We, need, we all need air to breathe. Microbes, if you've got tight soil, if it's dirt, there's no air, they can't breathe, they're dead. So foundationally, part of why we farmers have historically tilled the soil is because it's been tight and hard, and plants don't do well when there's no air in the soil, because the microbes who are actually the ones that feed them, need air to breathe. We've, you guys are familiar with this concept of green leaves and why plants have green leaves? I should start with that point. Some people, you know, in nature, most plants have green leaves. Yep. Um, I learned, I think it was ninth grade, where I learned it about photosynthesis. This uh, whole thing with carbon dioxide and water and sunlight equals oxygen and sugar. People heard that, heard that story? And we heard about the oxygen being taken out of the, atmosphere, out of the leaf and put into the atmosphere. That's what we breathe. What I did not learn in school, but I've subsequently learned, is that in nature, healthy plants inject a majority of the sugar they manufacture into the soil. Right? So they make sugar and oxygen, they cover their bodies in green to make oxygen and sugar, which they then inject out of their bodies. So if we've been raised in this concept of Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, um, it would seem to be a bad strategy for a whole kingdom to cover their bodies in green to make stuff that they don't, then don't use for themselves, right? But I would suggest that um, this is whole, maybe you've heard, what would Jesus do? Um, I, I just like to say, what would nature do? How does nature do it? <clears throat> Nature's been around for quite some time, operating things in a very sophisticated fashion. So. Um, if nature has determined that this is the pattern, maybe there's a reason for it. And as I understand it, the basic reason is there's a symbiotic relationship where the plants make the sugar that they inject into the soil to feed the microbes, that then digest the soil to feed the plants. That's how nature did it. That's how nature does it. That's how the forests work. That's how the prairies work. Um, um, so you need to have those green leaves making sugar to feed into the soil. Or if it's winter time, you need to have dead plant material there, which is you know that sugar complexed in organic matter that can then be used to feed the microbes. I like to say microbes don't fly to Florida for the winter; they have to stay and eat all winter long. I grew up on a farm where we had a root cellar and freezers, and we canned things and we dehydrated things. We didn't pick much between you know October and May but we put our food aside, and we had enough to eat over that period of time because we'd stockpiled it. So that's the, the brown cover on the soil, the cover crops, right? You wanna keep food in the environment. So you need air to breathe. The microbes need air to breathe, so you have to have air in the soil, and microbes need food to eat. So you must have green cover or brown cover or both. Um, um, <clears throat> water, most people are familiar with this concept of water. You need water to drink. Um, again, chickens, cows, children, don't water them for a week. They're probably going to be in rough shape. Um, if you stick your hand into the soil and you can pick it up and it's powder dry, 
you should not expect there to be microbes functioning well. In my experience as a farmer, it's after the soil dries out in the summer that you start to see the zucchini leaves go from dark green and shiny to just green to not so green to powdery mildew and dead. Right? It's when the heat of the summer comes on and it hasn't rained for a while, the soil dries out, is when the microbes stop functioning and the plant stops being fed. And so it starts eating up its fat reserves before it gets sick and dies. Right? You've heard about this thing about animals? They do this thing where if they eat too much, they stockpile the extra food in the form of fat. Anybody heard about this story? You've heard about that story? Yeah. Plants do the same thing. So when a plant is fat and happy, it's got a fat layer on it, which is a shiny leaf. That waxy cuticle, wax, wax is fat. So if you've seen a zucchini leaf that's got a sheen on it, that's got that radiant, you know, or a broccoli leaf, you know that look? You look at it and they have that sheen on them, they're fat and happy. You have that feeling like you know they're healthy, kind of like a cow, if a cow's got a sheen on its coat, right? A cow that's got a dull coat, you know something's wrong with it. A zucchini that's got a dull colored green leaf, you know something's wrong with it. Um, all these things actually fit together in a really beautiful way. Um, but it's, in my experience, about creating a dynamic where you maintain the, these things present in the ecosystem. You have to maintain air in the soil. So by hook or by crook, if there's no air in the soil, things aren't going to work. You've got to maintain for it. You have to maintain for water in the soil. You have to maintain for food in the environment. Um, you have to maintain for the microbes themselves to be present. In many cases, we've had um, toxins applied, disturbance, et cetera, whatever the environmental conditions have been, um, many of the species of microbes have been killed off. And so reestablishing them, inoculating them, is a really important and powerful thing to do. Um, you can buy spores of inoculant, you can make, you talked about Korean natural farming, um, there's, there's teas, there's any number of ways of, of establishing or reestablishing a full spectrum of microbes in the environment. But um, if, you know, glyphosate's been applied, DDT, uh, dicamba, you know, maybe it was in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was all these nuclear tests that were happening in Nevada. And anybody else ever seen the map of nuclear fallout in North America? It's basically the whole continent, right? Um, um, what is it, 70% of our rainwater now has glyphosate in it? I was just in Montana yesterday talking to an organic farmer who's been trying to export his wheat to Europe. Um, and a, a majority of the wheat that's raised on these organic farms is not being accepted in Europe because it's got glyphosate residue, not because of drift from the neighbors, but because of the rain. So we have these environmental conditions where toxins are present and functionally are working against the, um, the, the you know, microbial ecosystem. So I, I strongly suggest inoculation of, of seed. Um, people have heard about colostrum with a calf. You know about cows when they're born? If you take that calf away from its mother and you don't let it have colostrum, it'll be a dead cow in a week. Anybody familiar, about, familiar with this? Right? You put, cows, you put calves on a milk replacer, you got to do it after they get their colostrum, because if you do it before they get their colostrum, they'll be dead. Um, the colostrum is, your, is the prebiotic, the probiotic that helps establish gut flora. When you're born, there's nobody living between your mouth and your rear end, right? The alimentary canal has nobody in it. Of all the 90% of microbes I said live in your body, right, they get established through colostrum, that thing which comes out of the mother's breast after birth, before milk, is there to establish gut flora so your symbiotic ecosystem can be there so you can digest your food for you. Um, it's exactly the same for plants. When that plant is germinating, when it's being born, you want it to have colostrum so it can establish a good healthy gut flora. There's this thing called, um, um, you know, um, fungal, like people have this like purple seed or, or orange seed. You ever seen this stuff? They put this fungicide on seed. Have you heard about this? I mean, come on. Do you understand nothing? Like, we're going to ensure at birth you have a solid dose of antibiotics so you do not have a well-established gut flora, so you'll always be sickly and weak. So you'll be a colicky baby, right? Colicky babies cry because they don't digest their food well because they don't have a well-established gut flora. 
right? These are foundational principles of how nature has designed the systems to work. And in many cases, we behave in a way that is entirely antithetical to that. So um, inoculation, establishing a good, um, healthy gut flora at birth is a very, very powerful thing you can do, along with making sure there's air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat. Um, the final thing I like to talk about is minerals. Um, Jesse was talking about calcium. Um, there's a broad spectrum of different elements that are needed for life to function. There's these things called enzymes, um, which are like sockets and, wrench, uh, sockets and wrenches. You know, you got the, um, the Allen wrench, you got the Phillips head, you got the flat head, you got the 916s, the, 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 you know, the nine millimeters. I mean, people know about all these different size tools that get used for things over and over again. Right? If you're a farmer and you don't have all your tools, <laughs> This one little thing that's shaped just like this, if I don't have it, I can't do my job, right? It's like that with copper and zinc and cobalt and molybdenum, molybdenum and selenium and um, boron and sulfur. These are critical elements that nature needs at the core of its enzyme systems to go through its processes. processes. And when you have abused the soil, um, in many cases through extreme tillage, through you know, um, soil being blown off through leaching, it, you know, uh, underlying geological imbalances, whatever the dynamics are, if you don't have cobalt, you don't have B12. B12 is the center of a compound, I mean, cobalt is the center of a compound called B12. 80% of the species of soil life are B12 dependent. So if microbes are the bottom of the food chain and they need B12 to, to exist, and cobalt at the center of B12, and you don't have cobalt in your soil, then 80% of your species can't exist. Um, boron, sulfur, there's a whole bunch of these different elements that are actually critically important um, for microbes to function, for also plants to function, and interestingly also for humans to function because nature has, uses these similar patterns across the kingdoms. Um, so I'm gonna talk about nutrient density in a minute, and, and you know, nutrition is you know, foundationally something that most of us are concerned with. Not everybody's a gardener, not everybody's a farmer, but most of us eat food. Um, and what is or is not in our food has a nice, nice connection to our level of function. So um, there's all kinds of different ways of addressing mineral deficiencies. Um, there's some really natural things you can use like sea salt and rock dust. You can use fancy things like copper sulfate and zinc sulfate. Um, there's limestone, there's rock phosphate, there's, um, you know, I generally like to use naturally occurring materials as inexpensive and as local as possible. Um, personally, my thought is uh, we need a model for agriculture that is applicable for the entire planet. Um, I've spent uh, time in various countries and continents around the world, and um, you know, not everybody has access to sufficient compost to produce crops at the level you're talking about. Um, you know, we've got, we've got, I, I, we, have to, we have to understand how to work with nature in such a way to, um, to empower people in parts of the world that, where we have much less resource. Um, and as I understand it, you know, most of the things that we need are available on our land if we know how we're working. Um, some of the things we do need to bring in, I would say initially are the minerals. So um, most of the oceans are made out of seawater right, which is, has 92 different elements in it. Most of the continents are made out of rock, which has, depending on what kind of rock it is, 20, 30, 40, 50 different elements in it. Um, and you guys know how marketing works with companies, right? If there's a lot of something, then you can't charge much for it. If there's a limited supply of something, you can charge a lot for it. Um, I would suggest part of the reason why we don't know about the powerful opportunities that sea salt and rock dust have is because there's no way to make much money on them. Because they're simply present in such massive quantities, um, no company can justifiably create a label and a marketing re regimen and charge a premium for them because somebody else will come and say, hey, I got the same thing over here for half price. So um, um, what I've brought in on, 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 farm, on my farm, what I bring in and add basically is just those raw minerals. I do use mulch. I use hay mulch um, from, uh, you know, mulch hay, which is basically hay that got rained on between cutting and baling. 
um, which we generally have good supplies of in, in New England. Um, but foundationally bringing in from offsite is the minerals and then the cover crop seed. Um, and beyond that, you really don't need much to take uh, dead soil and turn it green um, should there be basically sufficient moisture and warmth. Um, some areas of the planet don't have enough water. That take takes a little bit more work. But a lot of the planet is actually, you know, a lot of the brown parts of the planet do get 10, 20, 30, 40 inches of rain a year. Um, those soils are worn out and denuded, but they can be systemically rebuilt, rejuvenated. Um, we can take the brown parts of the planet and make them green again um, very inexpensively, very efficiently, um, if we understand how to work with nature. So I think if that wasn't too fast and covered too many topics, I'm going to stop there um, and spend a few minutes on the topic of nutrient density and food quality, um, talk about what we're doing on that front, because um, that's what I was asked to talk about. So, um, all right, so people have heard um, or maybe had this experience of a carrot um, that was somewhat uh, bland or bitter or woody, but not particularly flavorful. Anybody? Yes? No? Had that experience? Perhaps you've had the experience of a carrot that um, was crisp and tasted carroty and you wanted to eat the whole thing really fast. Like, wow, that's a great carrot, right? How about a tomato? You ever eaten a tomato off the shelf from the grocery store, perhaps February? Um, maybe a Subway sub or I don't know where you got it, but it was like, you know, it looks like a tomato, but maybe it tastes a little more like a cucumber. Right? Um, but you've also had the experience of a tomato off the vine in August that was exquisite, right? Um, do you know that the USDA is very clear about what's in tomatoes? And apparently, according to the USDA, all tomatoes have exactly the same thing in them. Um, similarly with carrots and beef and rice and milk. Um, you know, if you go to the recycling center, you separate your number one plastic from your number two plastic and number five plastic. Right? You got your tin cans. Maybe you guys don't do that. Where I come from, we have to separate our, <laughs> we can't just throw it all in the same spot. Um, in an in industrial process, you have things that are like made to certain spec. So we can say number one plastic is a certain uniform type of thing. Um, number two plastic is a fairly uniform type of thing. Um, sure, in an industrial process where we're manufacturing things in a factory with set inputs and ingredients, you can pretty much predict what the output's going to be. Um, but that's not how nature works, right? That difference in flavor that you experience between this carrot and that carrot, or this tomato and that tomato, is a difference in nutritional level, right? Um, I think we heard Mark Schatzker in the movie talking about, what did he say? Your, your brain uses more synapses when eating than during sex. What was the other thing he used as an example for? I can't remember what it was. What was it? Math, math, and then maybe there's one more, right? 30% um, of our DNA is associated with a function of our nose and our tongue. 30% of your DNA. Think about all the things your body does, right? But smelling and tasting are considered to be very important by nature. Um, what's actually very exciting is, um, you know, the carrot that doesn't taste very good is a carrot that is relatively devoid of nutrients. And a carrot that does taste good is a carrot that's full of nutrients. Interestingly, we've evolved to discern the things that are better for us and the things that are less good for us. Um, so uh, unfortunately, what's been happening since you know, industrial ag has gotten to be quite so dominant is that nutrient levels have been decreasing in food. Right? The USDA has been documenting this since 1930s, 40s. Um, British government's been documenting it, the Japanese government's been documenting it, the German government's been documenting it. The nutrient levels have been decreasing in food for decades as we've um, produced more quantity, um, we've produced less quality. And uh, so as we see the nutrient levels decrease in food, we see the chronic illness, degenerative disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, et cetera, increase. There's a direct connection between what's in our food or not in our food and the level of function of our bodies. Um, and so we're now experiencing epidemic levels of chronic disease. We see children with diseases that children never used to have, um, you know, et cetera. We are, I would say, not that slowly degenerating. Um, and a large, to a large degree, it's because we simply don't have the nutrients in our food that our bodies need to function. So 
Um, one of the things that our organization has been focusing on is quality in food. And our idea is um, that people actually want to eat things that taste good and are good for them. And if we can help them choose from the food that's available to them, the stuff that's more flavorful and better for them, they will. And if people start choosing the better carrots off the shelf and leaving the worst carrots on the shelf, then the farmers that are producing the worst carrots are gonna have their buyers stop buying from them. And the farmers that are producing the better carrots are gonna have their buyers ask for more of them. And so with this whole thing called money, which seems to be having a very powerful effect in today's day and age, we can incentivize farmers to shift their practices to focus more on increasing quality in food, which also, by the way, increases carbon in soil um, and can reverse chronic disease, et cetera. So our thought is by focusing on food quality and saying, you know, who wants food that's more nutritious? Here's how you can get it. We can focus on solutions that will, um, we, don't, we don't need to fight chemical ag. We don't need to fight this or fight that. We can actually just focus on solutions. So if that makes broad, broad sort of sense. I just want to talk about the specifics of what we've been doing um, and, and um, you know, where it's going and then leave time for questions. So the concept is basically, you know, the question is, how would you choose between this carrot and that carrot? Um, as I said, I grew up on an organic farm. My parents had a day job. The day job my parents had was running an organic farming organization. They helped write some of the first organic standards in the country in the 80s. Um, so I've watched the organic movement from a back to the land, grassroots, sort of radical fringe edge culture community get you know taken over by the government and taken over by big business and become a fairly mainstream force in culture. Um, when I was a kid, if you said that chickens could be raised in a building and never get outside, and that would be certified organic, I would have laughed at you. But now that's true, right? If you had said that you can raise tomatoes or lettuce or blueberries in a pot, a plastic pot full of coconut coir, and that could be organic, I would have laughed at you. But now that's true, right? What the impulse and the ethos and the intention of the organic movement was 40, 50, 60 years ago has been, I would say, co-opted by the interests of profit. And so now a lot of things are passable in the organic standard that were not. Um, the vast majority of I mean, I don't want to talk about all the bad things that are going on in the organic community because I, when I buy food, buy organic. <laughs> it's better than not buying organic, I think, but there, maybe there's more to it than just that. So um, my thought was, you know, you can pervert a certification system. You can, con you can control a certification system up with a bureaucracy, with moneyed interests and power. Um, you know, good intentions can be weakened. So how would you create a dynamic where people can choose between this carrot and that carrot that could be trusted? That was the basic question. Um, and the idea is not by having a certification system and a label, but by being able to test in real time this carrot and that carrot. Um, so the concept is basically through a, a science called spectroscopy, um, which is, which is um, how we know what stars are made up of. If you maybe have heard, I think I just read something in the news, I think it was this morning about uh, a star maybe a few million light years away that where they were seeing water vapor in the atmosphere and like, huh, that's what's going on, right? How do you test the atmosphere of a star a few million light years away for, for water vapor? Anybody know? You don't send a little probe out there. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 took off the year I was born, 1977, and they're about 18 light hours away, right? 18 light hours away is how far we've sent anything and we're very confident about what things are made up of millions of light years away. And the way we're confident of that is through a science called spectroscopy, which basically says that everything that's an element or a compound in chemistry, like protein or copper or zinc, is a vibration in physics. So copper vibrates at a certain frequency, which is light. Zinc vibrates at a different frequency, which is light. Protein vibrates at another frequency, which is light. So if you can look closely at the light that's coming off of something, you can see what it's made up of. Um, so with a spectrometer, you can flash a light at this carrot and you can read what it's made up of. And you can flash a light at that carrot and read, a light, and read what it's made up of. So um, that was the idea. 
if we can give people the ability to, in their hand, go to the grocery store, go to the flash, go to the farmer's market, boop, boop, 20 out of 100, boop, boop, 40 out of 100, boop, boop, 80 out of 100, just your choice. This one's a buck 50 a pound, that's a buck 75, that's two bucks, you can choose. But if you could choose based on, with that information about nutritional value, which was at your hand, you didn't have to trust a certification system or a labeling system, our thought is some people would begin to ch change their purchasing decisions. Um, and so uh, we built this first, uh, first generation of this meter in 2017. Um, I will say that we're a nonprofit educational organization and everything we've done is open source and in the commons, which means we don't own it, which means it belongs to the people globally. There's copyright and there's copy left, right? Copyright means I own it. Copy left means everybody owns it. So all the science, all the tech, all the app, all the hardware that I'm gonna talk about here for the next few minutes is copy left. It's in the commons. Our thought is, this belongs to all of us. It's not the kind of thing that should be controlled and profited off of. It can be profited off of, but the core of it should be open. So um, in 2016, we started this project. We said, you know, could we actually shift the economic incentives in agriculture to such a degree that farmers have an incentive to focus on nutrition as opposed to volume? You know, is, is, could, could we do that? Because if because if we could, we could solve a lot of systemic issues. So we identified three things we had to do. Um, one was, can we build a handheld, open source, consumer price point, non-invasive, flash of light meter that can be calibrated to nutrient levels in crops? A, question. B, um, you know, is there a significant nutrient variation within crops? Because talking to scientists at that point in time, they said, oh, maybe it's a 2% variation or a 5% variation, but basically all carrots are the same. Look, the USDA says it right here. Um, our hypothesis was that there was a significant variation in the nutrient levels. Um, so can you build a meter? Do nutrients vary significantly? And three, do those nutrient variations connect to management practices, soil health, environmental conditions, or is it just genetics, like the knowledgeable scientists were telling us? Um, so in 2017, we built our first meter. Um, in 2018, we built our first lab and tested our first couple of crops, carrots and spinach. We had people send in crops from around the country, from farmers markets, from grocery stores, organic, not organic farms. Um, we said, we're not going to do randomized replicated trials. We're not going to be doing controls where we're testing one variable. Our question is, what is the nature of the food supply? We want to know at the point of purchase, What's the, various, what's the variation available for people? We wanted to see how big it is. What, is. what is it? So people sent in stuff from wherever they could. Um, if it was, I think it was calcium and carrots, it was about three to one. So this carrot, per every 100 grams of carrot, had as much calcium as those three carrots. 3x variation, not 3%, three to one. You have to eat three of these carrots to get as much calcium as you got from eating that one carrot. When it was iron and spinach, it was like 15 to one. So you'd have to eat 15 of these leaves of spinach to get as much iron as you got out of eating this one leaf of spinach. When we looked at polyphenols and antioxidants, which are sort of these higher order complex compounds that correlate with flavor and aroma and immunity and antimicrobial, antifungal, anti-cancer kind of capacities, those are more like 25 to one or 100 to one. I think the most we've found so far is with spinach and, and antioxidants. So the spinach with the least antioxidants and the spinach of the most antioxidants, the difference was 364.5 to one, which means you would have to eat one of this leaf of spinach every day from January 1st to December 31st at noon, half of a leaf, that's that 365th day, to get as many antioxidants as you got from eating this one leaf of spinach on January 1st. So there's a whole bunch of compounds in food, right? There's calcium, there's zinc, there's copper, there's potassium, there's vitamin D, there's vitamin C, there's various different enzymes, there's amino acids, there's lipids, there's proteins, there's a whole bunch of different nutrients in food. So calcium's three to one, you know, iron's 15 to one. We showed that variation was significant. This is 2018. 2019, we started our second lab at Chico State in California. Um, we started having farmers send in the soil they were um, growing the crops in. As, uh, along with the crops, along with answering a long series of questions like, did you till? If so, with what? How many times? How deeply? Did you cover crop? When did you plant? What did you plant? 
How did you terminate it? Did, what fertilizer did you use? What was the variety you used? When did you plant? Did you irrigate with what? Did you foliar spray? Did you side dress? So we asked a whole bunch of questions and then we had them send in the soil and then we had them send in the crop and we tested the crop, we tested the soil and we built this big database. So that was 2019, we did six crops. 2020, we did about 21 crops. We set up our third lab in Europe. Um, and by the end of the 2020 data year, we had enough data to say, yes, um, nutrients do vary. We had across roots, leaves, fruits, and grains, across you know, about 15 different elements and three different compound families. Um, dramatic nutrient variations were across the board. Um, we had enough data to calibrate this instrument to 10 different crops. So give me a carrot, I can flash a light, and I can tell you what the relative level of antioxidants are. Zucchini, I can tell you polyphenols. Oats and wheat, I can tell you a bunch of stuff. Um, so yes, you can build a handheld open source meter that has calibrated the nutrient levels. Yes, nutrient levels do vary significantly. And finally, yes, management practices, tillage is an example. Like oats and wheat, again, was a very, very strong correlations. I've got slides, I'm sorry I'm not presenting them for you, but I can cover more faster without slides than with slides, so I think you're following me. But if you want the slides, I can show them to you. Um, the more you till, the less organic matter is in the soil, and the less nutrients are in the food. Right? Direct connections between management practices, soil health metrics, and nutrient levels. Um, so that was 2021, and we finished, we, we sort of released that. I call it proof of concept. We've shown that it is, that these three things are true. You can build a meter, nutrients do vary. Those nutrient levels connect to soil health and how you treat the soil. And so now we're working on um, defining nutrient density. So instead of saying, where does this carrot sit with calcium and potassium, we're saying, from an overall standpoint of all the nutrients in a carrot, where does this carrot sit? Is it at 80 out of 100, or 40 out of 100, or 20 out of 100? And that's where we're at right now, is working on that process. We started with beef, um, because beef is the crop with the largest ecological footprint, as in most acres on the planet are used in the production of beef. Um, it also is the crop with the largest economic footprint, as in more dollars, euros, yen, rupees, et cetera, are spent on beef than any other crop. So if we're gonna try to systemically shift the food supply through economics, let's start with beef as opposed to cucumbers, right? I mean, cucumbers are nice, but <laughs> it's gonna cost us a million dollars to do this science project. To define nutrient density in beef is a million bucks. And because we're doing everything in the commons open source, that's coming through charitable donations. There's no big company that's investing in us so they can get data that they, only they can have and they can control. Um, so it's a project. We will. Um, be releasing our first uh, beef papers, published papers this summer. Um, so our, at least our preliminary definitions. It may not be 85, 84, 83, 82 definitions. It may just be red, yellow, green. This steak is in the red. Of all steaks, it's not very good. The steak is in the yellow, it's decent. The steak is green. Um, so we're starting, we're moving forward. Um, but the general concept here is to um, you know, not only calibrate or define quality from a nutritional standpoint, um, but to be able to calibrate the next generation of instruments, but then also to be able to connect those nutrient levels in the crops to management practices and causal dynamics. So we can share with growers globally, it looks like from other data we've got from your area, from your soil type, these practices are gonna correlate with better results and these practices are gonna correlate with worse results. Anybody who's a farmer may have had the experience of having someone who's charismatic or apparently knowledgeable trying to sell them a product. Anybody ever been sold products by people? I'm a farmer. I don't like being sold stuff. I want to know what's going on. I want to make my own decisions. Um, and I, you know, if we can have an open data set where we'll be able to connect results with causal factors, then we can figure out this inoculant actually is definitely worth the money, and that one is not. This fertilizer actually is really good, and that one is not. Um, this whole suite of fertilizers is detrimental. Like, we do not have an open, honest, you know, data set which helps us discern what is worth it, what is beneficial, what is detrimental, et cetera. So, 
Broadly, that's what we're working on. I think I've probably used most of my 45 minutes. There's clocks there, and I didn't check to see when I started, but um, <laughs> close enough? All right. I'll stop now for questions. Yeah. Uh, basically, two questions um, on the first one on your instruments. Yeah. Uh, it's somewhat similar to a refractometer, as I understand what you're saying. Does the ripeness of the vegetable, the sugar content, throw off your numbers? Um, well, it, if it doesn't correlate with refractometer, I would say we probably have a bad definition because I'm pretty sure a refractometer is a really good tool for testing quality. The best tool, of course, is your tongue, right? God gave us all extraordinarily sophisticated nutrient monitoring devices, right? Right? Yep. Are we aware of this? Yep. Right? The best tool you'll ever get is the one you already have, the one you're living in, the one you're in, incarnated into. So while I'm working on building this high-tech fancy, fancy thing, it's actually a covert op to try to remind you that all the wisdom and knowledge you ever need, you already have inside. But this culture has trained us to pay attention to things outside as opposed to things inside. So we've got to figure out how to redirect that attention. So a refractometer is a good instrument. Um, this is not a refractometer. It, it um, works on different principles. If it, it's a spectrometer, exactly. Um, so. Refractometers do not measure sugar, as a, not a minor point. They are calibrated to percent sucrose, but they measure total dissolved solids. Refractometers measure a whole bunch of things in plant sap or in crop. Um, as a minor point, personally a pet peeve, but yes. Subject, uh, as I'm giving uh, uh, vitamins and minerals to my cows, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for bioabsorption. Yeah. Uh, why don't we do that with people? People do take vitamins. Um, and many of the vitamins they take come in one end and go out the other. I say, why don't we have our nutrients in our food where it belongs? I don't think you should be giving vitamins to cows or chickens or people. I think cows and chickens and people should be eating food that has flavor, and then they won't need vitamins in the first place. Um, and vitamins are expensive and you know, my understanding is if you get those necessary ingredient elements, the rock minerals, the sea salt, into the environment, onto the land, the microbes will digest it, they'll put it into the forage or whatever it is the animals are eating, and that'll be a, a much more appropriate, more bioavailable form than anything you're going to buy in a packaged product and much less expensive. So, um, um, there's any number of nuances we can discuss about how to systemically revivify the ecosystem. Um, the role of cover crops, the role of polycultures, the role of medicinal plants. Um, there's all kinds of ways we can talk about um, rejuvenating the ecosystem. I think foundationally, as producers, farmers, growers, gardeners, ranchers, um, part of our responsibility is caretakers of the ecosystem. And so, you know, if we're just thinking about trying to take profit and not trying to think about how to build the maximum vitality in the land, um, well, I would say, ideally, we're focusing on full ecosystem re reju rejuvenation. That's, our, I, I, in my perspective, that should be how we're focusing. Um, but anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I guess we kind of commented a little bit. What's been the experience with taking your spectrum? Because the, these things, these practices help that going to the farmers to say, here's how to make the better care, here's how to get the better tomato on there. Do you have farmers walking your fields with that? They have the soil test, they have the spectrometer test, or just kind of take them? Um, so, right now, all this is calibrated to is, you know, like I said, polyphenols and carrots, antioxidants and zucchini. Um, and those are just, that's one family of compounds in one crop. I, I, I'd like to say categorically, I don't think we know what good and bad are from a nutritional standpoint. We do not know what nutrient density is yet. That's what we're trying to work on. Like, we have to figure out what good and bad are before we can back it out to determine what are the environmental conditions that are causal. 
if we're going to try to do this properly in the peer-reviewed Western rational scientific framework, which I think is a, 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 a good framework to be operating within because anybody who's being intellectually honest can find that as a lingua franca, right? Some people can say, this tastes better. Some people can say, you know, if, if, we, if we allow subjectivity to get involved, then we're going to go, it's going to get, go sideways really fast. So in my mind, the first thing to do is to determine what good and bad are and then determine what the causal dynamics are that are connected to those things, and then we can do what you're talking about. So we're not in a place to be doing that yet because we don't know what quality is. Um, it just, it seems like we, we, th that's, yeah, we haven't figured it out yet. So um, people are like, when can I get a meter? I'm like, you can build a meter, but if we don't know what quality is, you can't calibrate the meter to anything. So I can sell, I've sold hundreds of these meters already. The specs are online for anybody to build and sell hundreds more or thousands more if they want to. But if we don't know what quality is, it can't be calibrated to it yet. So um, did everybody get that point? Or if you didn't get it, you don't know you didn't get it. But um, it's a really important point. Like we have to figure out what quality is first before we can really properly integrate and implement this whole broad strategy. And um, it basically costs about a million dollars a crop to do that. So beef, million dollars. Chicken, million dollars. Pork, million dollars. Oats, million dollars. Wheat, mil right. So 50, 100 million dollars. Anybody, got any rich relatives? Um, <laughs> we can get it done pretty quick. But right now, that's the limiting factor, is the money to do the science, to be able to stand confidently on this, and then be able to bring it forward systemically. What, so what's your... Um, uh, June or July, we're going to have our first papers published. Um, so, um, I'm, like I said, I don't think it's going to be 80, 70, 60, 40, uh, 60, 50, 40. It's not going to be 10th percentiles. It probably will just be a red, yellow, green. Um, I assume this is going to be an iterative process, an evolving process. I don't think we're necessarily going to have all the answers immediately. Um, for $50,000, we can do enough work on a crop to be able to say what we think probably 101 are. Um, and then it's a process. So right now, you know, there's people in California that grow almonds that are interested in figuring out almonds. And there's people that are looking at wheat that are interested in doing wheat. There's people that are doing potatoes that are interested in doing potatoes. So we're, what we're doing right now is saying, okay, who is interested in doing this? There's companies, there's universities, there's governmental agencies, there's organizations, there's consumer groups, um, there's rich, you know, philanthropically minded individuals foundations. So, um, yeah, I've been in, I'm, you know, Elon Musk is always, it's like, we'll get this done in a month and a half, and it takes three years, right? So, um, <laughs> you got his number. He's a busy man. Um, I bet, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I was just in Montana yesterday talking to some people. I mean, there is actually a, a global convivium coming together around some things like all those fancy lab machines they have, anyone at a GC or an LC or a um, T, what are they, PTOF things are, like the fancy things they've got in universities and companies to like figure out what's in, a, what's in a thing, like the piece of lab equipment. There's not like a universal framework for actually assessing those things. Like this university has their protocol and that university has their protocol. It's like Tower of Babel. Remember wow. Babel? Yeah. Right? Like that's where the science is at right now. And so there is actually a global process coming together right now to unify that with national agency labs and, you know, land grant universities across the planet. So um, I don't think it's going to be us. I think it's going to be we. I mean, us as in the BFA. I think it's going to be we coming together and doing this. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to give you an answer. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. What's the deadline? We got to figure out what good and bad are in a carrot first. And then we will know what the elements and nu nutrients are to count that that spectrometer has to be able to test. 
you can't even engineer the spectrometer until you know what it's, what it's going to be calibrated to. So there's many dozens of hundreds of companies out there around the world building spectrometers. There's many spectrometers out there. There's some that are $100, $150 a piece. There's some that are $50,000 a piece or $10,000 or, or, or $1,500 a piece. Um, we, we don't know yet what the price point is of the one that's going to be good enough to test a carrot because we don't know what a good carrot is yet. But if anybody remembers like um, CDs, remember CDs back in the olden days, right? right? Before there were CDs or when there were just a few CDs, a CD player cost $10,000. And then at the end of the run of CDs, a CD player cost $10, right? So they're, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's like the first ones are going to cost a lot because there's only a few of them made. But once we figure out how to mass produce them, the price point's going to drop dramatically. My end game vision is that one of the cameras in your smartphone is your spectrometer. So you don't actually need to have your own spectrometer. It could just be one of the cameras in your smartphone. And I think that's entirely plausible. If that's five years out, I mean, we, that'd be awesome if we, it'll be, we'll be there in five years. I don't know. I don't know. What's the nonprofit? Bionutrient Food Association. Bionutrient.org is the website. And you're talking about um, maybe June, July, after the paper on the Yep. Will that paper say what the... Uh, what the production for, say, you're going to be red, yellow, green. So the green ones, are you going to have the background on what makes it? Every single, every single sample, we have, a, we have a, um, a fecal material assessment, which has 200 different species of microbes. We have the soil assessment. We have the forage or, or TMR assessment. And we have the management practices. So you'll have the management practices in those papers that show us what is the better Yep. 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 It's all open source. It's all in the commons. There's going to be a certain amount that's in the paper, and then everything else is the raw data is here. You can go parse through it if you want to do that. Yeah. Foundationally, that's the objective here is to pull this all together in an open framework. Yep. Do you have any recommendations for like gardeners uh, what you should do to your soil to try and jumpstart this? Yes. Uh, I do. <laughs> Um, so when I started my farm, um, we bought some land that was an old dairy farm um, that was nice and tight, nice, tight, hard, yellow, not, it was dirt, right? I mean, you, you jump on a shovel and get a little chink out, um, yeah, goldenrod, um, uh, milkweed, and low-growing brambles. Yeah, you guys have those kinds of things out here? I mean, maybe you're, I'm not sure if your soils are exactly right, but it wasn't grass, right? It was, it was, it was, it was a rough shape. And so what I did, um, first thing I did was took a soil test and identify what minerals were deficient. Because where I live in Massachusetts, it rains a lot, and we know a lot of, our, a lot of minerals are deficient in our soils. And as I said before, that's one of the key ingredients. Um, I mixed all those minerals up in a on a cement pad, I took my tractor, rototiller, I just drove back and forth with the rototiller in first gear and spun them up, picked them up with a bucket, walked out in front of the bucket with a shovel and whipped them out there in the field, and then put the uh, kids and some rocks on the back of the tiller, went back and forth about five times to see if we could get down about two inches because it was really tight, hard soil, and tight, hard means no air. So I addressed mineral efficiencies, I addressed air deficiency. Um, then I made my beds. I put my seedlings in, um, I, I had inoculated the rows, so I put the inoculant um, in the row, um, so the microbes were there, so I addressed the, I addressed the microbe deficiency. Um, then I put drip tape down so I could maintain sufficient water, and then I mulched so I could have food. So I took my environment and I worked to address the deficiencies of minerals, air, water, microbes and food. Because my experience as a farmer is, if those things are present, I can go swimming and play with the kids and nature will take care of the work. Um, and it was less than two months later when the soil was dark in color, had aroma, had night crawlers, and plants growing vigorously. So, um, I mean, I can, you'd want to, Take a soil test, we'd want to talk about what specific mineral deficiency you want to address, but 
I mean, it really, in my mind, is actually quite simple. Like air, water, food, minerals, and microbes. If you have those basic things present, nature seems to be happy to take care of the work. Um, any one of those things not present, and nature can't do her job. And it's on you. You're the caretaker. You've done a bad job. So once, that, once those beds are established, I don't need to till again. Right? Once, you've got the, once you've got the air, once you've got the, the minerals, once you've got the organic matter, once that's all there, then you can, then you can do minimal disturbance, um, put your cover crops in, keep the mulch going, cycle things, do polycultures, et cetera. But um, you know, if you can't stick your hand into your soil, it's too tight. If you pick it up and it feels dry, there's not enough water. Right? Common sense. And at different times of the year, different things are deficient. So you got to be out there. What do they say the best fertilizer is the farmer's footstep? Anybody heard that one? The best fertilizer is the farmer's footstep? Come on, somebody must have heard that. The farmer's shadow? The best fertilizer is the farmer's shadow? Get out there and talk to your plants. What's up, guys? How you doing? We're actually really thirsty. <laughs> do you mind? <laughs> um, don't just water the plant. It, it's about the microbes. The entire soil profile should be maintained with sufficient moisture. Anywhere where the soil is dry, the microbes are dead. There should be as much plant above ground as there is plant below ground. So don't just water the spot where the stem goes into the plant, into the ground, if you've got a five foot tall tomato plant. You've got to have the whole area moist. Um, so it's really about being present and using common sense. I, mean, I grew up on a farm, so maybe it's not fair because I just, you know, I grew up in that environment. So for me, things are self-evident that aren't evident to other people. But, um, you know, if you think about children, um, you know, if they haven't eaten all day, they're going to start acting out, right? Um, if you stick a plastic bag over their head, <laughs> they're not going to do well tomorrow. Um, so uh, it's, it, it, I'm sorry, I don't want to, yeah. Um, those are, yeah, so. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, you mentioned that when you get samples that come in, you ask for all this information. Yeah. Do you, do you ask anything about whether the, the, the crop was under any some degree of weather stress? And so um, we do ask for their address, so we're able to track, uh, so we can, we can input the climate dynamics of temperature and, and moisture. Um, Etc. Um, we do offer complete anonymity to anybody who takes part in the project. Um, all samples are anonymized by county, down to the county level. So um, no one will ever know who you are if you submit your sample, unless you're proud of the result. And then you want to tell people who you are. Because um, a lot of farmers actually don't really want to know how good their crops are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Across the river, and we find that the weather stress completely overwhelms any past management in terms of the, the, the quality of the grain or even the, the, in the store itself. And so it's like the, the weather variability becomes the driving factor in what you see. And so that, that's why I'm asking. Right. So. My understanding is, you know, if you've got two farms that are adjacent to each other, and one has 1% organic matter, one has 5% organic matter, the one that has 5% organic matter is going to be able to do better in a drought and better in a flood than the one with 1% organic matter. So you've got a whole bioregion. I mean, last summer, we got how many inches of rain? Like one and a half or two or something like that? What was it? It was pretty damn dry, right? Maybe that's an extreme situation. So if you're at that level of extreme, you're going to have a hard time getting a crop out of anywhere. But maybe you've got just a relatively dry year. The farms with the low organic matter levels, in my understanding, and I think this is relatively well borne out by the data, are going to have a harder time than the ones with a high organic matter level. So um, it seems to me, it seems from the data, that there's a suite of factors that affect plant health. And what we're trying to do is, oops, uh, create a situation where as many of those factors are beneficial as possible. Um, 
and we can't tease it all out. So um, I know, I mean, I'll just use an example of many years ago, we had a very cold, wet spring, um, and people put the tomato crops in, and it was rainy, and it was cold, and it was cloudy, and um, there was this thing called late blight that came up from down south, and um, it was basically a crop failure across the board. The environmental conditions were such that the, the tomato plants were susceptible to this pathogen. Um, and UMass was telling people to get out there with trash bags and drop them over tomato plants, zip time, and bring them to the dump, because that was a way to get rid of spores, right? which is totally ridiculous. But anyway, um, what I told people was, no sunlight means not enough sugar. Too much water means nutrients being leached out. So how about five pounds of sea salt and one gallon of molasses per acre? And so I had, I, what I did on my farm, what I told other people to do, was take five pounds of sea salt and one gallon of molasses, solubilize it, put it out through whatever way you can, a foliar sprayer or an irrigation system, to raise the soil conductivity so that you can provide sufficient nutrients to the plants to be able to get through this period of nutrient stress, right? Lots of rain flowing through the system in a plant would be diarrhea for a human, right? Way more fluid flowing through your system, nutrients being leached out of your system, that's called diarrhea. In Africa, it's called giardia. You know, hundreds of thousands of children die every year from a bad case of diarrhea because their nutri they have insufficient nutrients to maintain their electrolytes. So what I said was, we've got serious weather stress. Understand that, understand what, how that's affecting the crop modulate that stress with a strategic action until the weather shifts. And I sold a whole bunch of tomatoes that year at whatever price I wanted to. I kept my price because I don't like charging a premium. I made tons of money because nobody else had tomatoes. I could sell every single tomato I could produce because everybody else's tomatoes were dead. I mean, it was an amazing year. I said, bring on the blight, right? As far as I'm concerned, bring on the climate extremes the more we understand how to, you know, how biological systems work, the more we can put our fingers on the scale to address those imbalances. I understand if you're working on massive scale, and, and I was in, like I said, I was in Montana yesterday talking to some wheat growers, and their you know, profit on a good year is $100 an acre. Their, their gross is 250 an acre. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 250 an acre? I don't know. Um, maybe farms shouldn't be that big, but we can, there's a whole bunch of conversations we can have about the way we do things and the way things should be done. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we're animals. We belong on the land. We don't belong in boxes and cities. Um, you know, so there's a whole systemic conversation we can engage about what's going on and how to address these systemic issues. But yeah, I'll stop there without hopefully going too far off the deep end. Um, <laughs> Well, that question at least. I'm happy to take more questions until I get pulled off the stage. If the land was using a lot of pesticides year after year, yep. is there a way to speed up the microbes to get rid of that, or is it just time? Um, so um, microbes are actually really good at digesting toxins. PCBs, dioxin, um, radiation, um, you know, the literature is, is pretty categorical. The, the bacteria, the fungi, et cetera, depending on which species you're looking at, which kingdom, which family genus, um, we know that microbes can break down these toxins, period, converse, end of conversation. Um, what would be a good way to stimulate that microbial activity? Um, a good recipe is, I think, is a one part liquid humates, one part sea salt, seawater, one part molasses. So max, a heavy duty dose would be 10 gallons per acre of one part humates, one part molasses, one part seawater. That's gonna give you a broad spectrum of trace elements. It's gonna give you that stable organic matrix and it's gonna give you lots of food for the microbes. Anybody who's heard of John Kempf may have heard of a product called Rejuvenate and that's basically the ingredients. That's the recipe. Um, so um, yes, you can absolutely stimulate microbial activity um, you might want to add an inoculant while you're doing that. Um, but addressing toxin load in the environment is a foundational issue that needs to be considered and addressed. H absolutely. Yep. Have I used up my 15 minutes? I think I probably have. All right. I just have a One more. I used to work in a garden center, and 
Yeah. It came out with this micro mycorrhizae. Mm -hmm. And so is that that's kind of what you're talking about. It helps the roots grow, it loosens the soil, and it just So mycorrhizae is a type of, of fun fungi that a lot of plants have symbiotic relationships with that really profoundly improves their overall function. It's, it's one of those members of the gut flora community. Yeah, and it's a very powerful one. Um, ideally, you don't want to have just one, like anybody who's ever taken a, um, a um, what do you call it? Um, probiotic. probiotic, yes, thank you. If you've taken a probiotic and you look on, this, look on it and it says like, this probiotic contains this microbe, great. In nature, you've got how many different hundreds or thousands of species of microbes in your gut? So we don't want to be just adding one. I mean, one is better than zero, but ideally we're looking at a dozen families, at least in each kingdom of bacteria and fungi in a good inoculant. Ideally, we're, we're adding a very broad spectrum of species to the ecosystem, to that seed, et cetera. But yes, mycorrhizae is a very powerful one. Yeah. All right. I think I've used up my time. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.